a very good evening aspirants welcome to the hindi news analysis by shankar ias academy for the date 6th of september 2021 today we have a variety of news articles for discussion but today we are going to start with a special session called as important terminologies in this session we are going to see about two important terminologies that appeared in yesterday's newspaper these are the hyacian world and hexen so this topic is not only important from prelims perspective but the discussion on hyacian world is also important from the mains perspective so you'll see what are these in the first discussion now after this discussion we have a discussion on oped article which is based on the law making so pay attention to this also this is important from mains perspective now our next discussion is going to be based on a river called as manjira we'll see its important tributaries and where it is located etc and next we are going to see about an economics topic this topic is going to be based on uh, the terminology is called as futures and options and in this same discussion we'll also see what is the relationship between the price of gold and us dollar and in this next discussion we are going to see about a social reformer called as ayodhya das pandita and we'll also see some other social reformers from south india now in this next discussion we are going to see what are logistics agreements what are its benefits and some of the logistics agreements that india has with other countries now our next discussion is going to be based on this editorial article in this article we are going to discuss about the issues with the existing reservation system in our country and our last discussion is going to be based on the residence certificate uh, that has been newly introduced in ladakh and we'll also see its comparison with the domicile certificate of jammu and kashmir so after that we have uh, four prelims questions for discussion today so with this introduction now let us move on to the first discussion so viewers our first session is going to be based on the important terminologies and these terms appeared in yesterday's newspaper these terms are important from prelims perspective and also from mains perspective especially the first one the first one we are going to see is about the hyacian world or hyacian world see this term includes world so you would have guessed that we are talking about planets here and this hyacian world is a new class of exoplanet especially the habitable ones so first let us have a brief understanding about exoplanets then we'll see about this hyacian world so what do we mean by an exoplanet it is any planet that is beyond our solar system see most of these exoplanets they orbit other stars but there are also some free floating exoplanets and these are called as rogue planets so these uh, rogue planets orbit the galactic center and they are untethered or they are untied to any star so that means we have two kinds of exoplanets those that orbit a star and those which don't orbit a star so for many years scientists have been studying these exoplanets and after measuring uh, their sizes that is their diameters and their masses scientists agree that these exoplanets compositions they range from uh, very rocky to very gas rich planets that is some planets are rocky and some are rich in gas but you have to understand that basically these exoplanets are made up of elements that is similar to those of the planets in our solar system itself but the mixes of these elements may differ in exoplanets the elements are similar but the proportion and mixes is different so in this way some planets uh, may be dominated by water or ice and some may even be dominated by iron or carbon therefore based on these characteristics of exoplanets so far uh, scientists have categorized the exoplanets into four types these four types are the gas giant neptunian super earth and terrestrial So this is the first type is the gas giant type. See these are the large planets but they are mostly composed mainly of gases. Especially they are composed of helium and or or hydrogen. Here you should understand that these gas giants they are like the Jupiter and Saturn uh, which are present in our solar system. So these gas giants also do not have hard surfaces. Instead they have swirling gases above a solid core. So here you can see the examples of uh, gas giants. 
Kelch 9b, Kepler 7b, these are gas giants. Now, next type is the super earths. Now, this is a class of planets which are unlike the ones in our solar system. That is, they are not like the ones in our solar system. And here the term earth actually refers to the size of earth only and not the characteristics of earth. So, don't get confused here. And therefore, an exoplanet is classified as a super earth based on its size. Now, these super earths are more massive than earth, but they are lighter than ice giants like uh, Neptune and Uranus. They are usually between uh, twice the size of earth and up to 10 times the mass of earth. So, understand that the super earths are bigger than the earth. Now, these super earths can be made of gas, rock or even a combination of both. And sometimes these super earths also referred to as uh, sub Neptunes or mini Neptunes. Why? Because when these super earth exoplanets, they are at the upper limits of the size limit. That is when they are, you know, almost twice the size of earth or almost 10 times the mass of earth. Then these are called as sub Neptunes or mini Neptunes. So remember the terms sub Neptunes and mini Neptunes are related to exoplanets only, especially super earths. And here are the two other examples of super earth. You can take note of it. Now the next type is the Neptunian uh, exoplanets. Now these are similar in size to the planet of uh, Neptune or Uranus in our solar system. So sometimes these are also called as Neptune like exoplanets. And therefore they typically have hydrogen and helium dominated atmospheres with cores or rock and heavier metals. So these two are the Neptunian exoplanets or the Neptune like exoplanets. Now the last type is the terrestrial uh, exoplanets. So if you see our solar system, Earth, Mars, Mercury and Venus, they are called as terrestrial planets or rocky planets. Why? Because generally the terrestrial planets are rocky worlds. They are composed of rock, silicate, water and even carbon. So therefore, for the planets which are outside our solar system, they also sometimes have these terrestrial characteristics. And especially when these exoplanets are half of Earth's size to twice its radius, they are uh, considered terrestrial. And sometimes these terrestrial planets, they are even smaller than Earth's size. But here don't get confused with respect to super Earths because we saw that exoplanets which are twice the size of Earth and uh, having larger body, these are called as super Earths. So that means consider that this is Earth and this is a planet half the size of Earth. And this is a planet having twice the radius of Earth. Then the planets in this range will be called as terrestrial planets. But the planets from twice the size of Earth, they will be called as super Earths. And that is why sometimes it is said that the larger terrestrial exoplanets are called as super Earths. So this is the relationship between the terrestrial exoplanets and super Earths. So these were the four types that existed so far. And now a new class of exoplanet has been classified. And this type is called as the Hycian world. See this world, it is composed of uh, water rich interiors with massive oceans. And these are present under atmospheres that are rich in H2 that is hydrogen. So you can understand that the term Hycian is a combination of hydrogen plus ocean. So Hycian planets are the ones which have the presence of substantial hydrogen in the atmospheres and they have large oceans on their surfaces. And according to the scientists and researchers, the density of such Hycian world is between uh, rocky super earths and more extended mini Neptunes. But why suddenly it was in news yesterday? See, it was in news because researchers have found that and they have classified that these planets could be optimal candidates in the search for uh, exoplanetary habitability. And therefore, they also believe that these Hyzian worlds may be abundant in the exoplanet population. And they also stipulate that such Hyzian planets can be significantly larger compared to the previous considerations for habitable planets. Previously, they thought that habitable exoplanets would be smaller in size. But now, after some research, they are saying that they could be significantly larger. But here, you have to remember that the term Hyzian world is not yet officially recognized. So, remember that this term is related to exoplanets, especially the ones which are rich in oceans, that is, which are rich in water and which have hydrogen atmosphere. And they are between the rocky super earths and uh, mini Neptunes. So that is all. In this discussion, we saw about the term Hyzian world. We saw about the exoplanets, their types such as the gas giants, 
terrestrial uh, exoplanets we saw about super earths and we also saw about the neptunians now let us move on to the next important term now the next important term is hexane so the news with respect to this term was that a refinery near the chennai city has produced highest quantity of food grade hexane this was the news yesterday so what you have to know is about some of its characteristics and its uses see the chemical formula for hexane is c6h14 and it is a colorless volatile liquid and this liquid is insoluble in water and it is also highly flammable but what you have to more focus on is about the uses of hexane the main use of hexane is as a solvent it is used as a solvent to extract edible oils from seed and vegetable crops such as the soybean peanuts corn etc so that means hexane is used as a solvent to extract edible oils from soybean peanuts and corn and the hexane which is used here is the food grade hexane apart from that we also have commercial grades of hexane and these are used as solvents for glues such as for rubber cement adhesives and they are also used as solvents for varnishes and inks apart from this hexane is also used as a cleaning agent in the printing industry and they are also used as a liquid in low temperature thermometers so these are some of the important uses of hexane now there are also some health effects related to hexane for example when high levels of hexane is inhaled for a short time then it causes a mild central nervous system effects it also causes dizziness slight nausea and headache so these are the health effects of hexane so with this area we have come to the end of this session now we are moving to the articles discussion session and our first discussion is going to be based on this oped article this article talks about how legislative processes are diluted and how judiciary can play a role in bettering the legislative processes so let us look into these aspects in detail we'll see how the legislative processes are diluted and what are the way forwards the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference see as you all know we have a parliamentary democracy and parliament is the supreme law making body in our country and this parliament is a representative body that is it has representatives from different parts of india and this parliament has been conceived as a place where the policies can be deliberated and discussed among the various representatives that is why we have the mechanism to pass the bills by simple majority simple majority is nothing but when the majority of members are present and voting so most of the bills employ this method of passing the bill except for some constitutional amendment bills now this mechanism makes sure that majority of those in the parliament are satisfied with the proposed bill so ensuring majority is an accountability mechanism and we know that often bills are also referred to the parliamentary committees for additional scrutiny so this process gives an additional layer of scrutiny with respect to the bills but recently if you see the government is flaunting the parliamentary efficacy through the number of bills that it passes that is government is flaunting that it is passing many bills and through this it is showing that parliament and lawmakers are functioning to their potential here you have to understand one thing that is time is finite so within a given amount of time we can only discuss certain things and that means an increase in the sheer volume of bills simply indicates that deliberations may not have taken place that is discussions may not have happened while passing these bills but how without deliberations or discussions these bills are passed see there are many instances and there are many loopholes based on which deliberations are bypassed by the government let us see them one by one See one of the first measures that is used to bypass deliberation is voice votes. If you remember uh, some important bills like the controversial form laws were passed through voice votes only. So that means the exact number of members who are in favor of this bill and the numbers who are uh, against this bill were not recorded because the bills were passed through voice votes. So this is one of the mechanisms. Now in another instance what happened was the other bill was passed as a money bill see according to indian constitution only those bills which contain provisions exclusively on matters listed in article 110 of the constitution they can be called as money bills so on this basis a bill 
is moneyable if it results in imposition abolition remission alteration or regulation of any tax at the union level or at the state level but not at the local level therefore money bills exist in parliament and state legislatures only and therefore if a financial bill results in imposition abolition remission alteration or regulation at local level by a local body then it is not considered to be a money bill so on these lines aadhar will not qualify to be a money bill because it did not only contain the matters listed in article 110 but still it was considered as a money bill by the speaker because we know that according to the constitution when a speaker calls a bill as a money bill then it will be considered a money bill only no one can question it and government used this loophole and get the bills passed and it used the same route to pass the other bill also and we know that money bill route is also used many other times to bypass this could in your rajya sabha see basically rajya sabha keeps an eye on the laws made by the lok sabha it makes sure that laws are not passed arbitrarily but when it comes to money bills rajya sabha has restricted powers only because rajya sabha cannot reject or amend a money bill it can only make recommendations to the lok sabha so with respect to money bill rajya sabha must return the bill to lok sabha within 14 days either with recommendations or without recommendations and here lok sabha has additional powers with respect to money bill because it can either accept or even reject the recommendations of the rajya sabha but whether it accepts or rejects the bill is deemed to be passed either in its original form or in its modified form so for this purpose also money bill route is used by the government and besides all this a lot of times the bills are also passed without sending them to the scrutiny by parliamentary committees so based on these instances author believes that the solution to overcome these instances lies with the judiciary because if you see judiciary has intervened in the other case already so considering this author has recommended two important suggestions the first suggestion is that judiciary can make deliberation as a factor in evaluating the constitutional validity of laws that is courts should explore the possibility of invalidating a law because the procedure that governed the law is bad or it is not appropriate what author means is that if the procedure that is followed for passing a law is not correct or if it is inappropriate or if it is done by following the loopholes then judiciary should explore the possibility of invalidating such a law and if this happens then judiciary can also make it compulsory that deliberation should happen before passing a law this is the first suggestion now the second suggestion is intra institutional reforms that is legislature in itself they should take uh, steps to reform the process rather than reforming through judicial regulation so when the judiciary interferes and it regulates the legislature like the one we suggested in the first suggestion then it could compromise the independence of legislature and this will subsequently impact the separation of powers that is envisaged in the constitution so we can conclude that legislative organ is that place where diverse interest groups find representation and therefore deliberation in such a forum ensures that the views of persons who are adversely affected by a law are definitely heard but when laws are passed without deliberation or without careful consideration then it just renders parliament as a rubber stamp and when this happens it sacrifices two core ideals of constitutional democracy one is equal participation and the second one is respect for the fundamental rights so therefore based on the suggestions of the author we can say that reformation of legislature is the need of the hour and if legislature reforms itself it is well and good so these are some of the points that you can take note from this oped article so this is a burning issue so in this discussion you have to focus on the ways and measures taken by the government to bypass deliberations and from this discussion we have got two suggestions as a solution to that problem so take note of these points it will help you in your mains answer writing now let us move on to the next discussion now let us take up this news article it mentions about the manjira river the news is that the heavy rains in the states of karnataka and maharashtra for the last couple of days they have been beneficial to the dams constructed on the manjira river and the news article talks about the singur dam and nisam sagar dam 
So in this discussion, let us have a brief understanding about Manjira River and also about these dams. First, let us hear about the Manjira River. See, this river is also known as Manjira and Manjara River. It is a major river in India. This river rises from Gaurwadi village in Balagat range. And this village is located in Bead district of Maharashtra. So after rising from this village, Manjira river flows in the west to east direction. And it travels a course of 724 kilometers. Now during its total course, Manjira river passes through three states. They are Maharashtra, Karnataka and Telangana. So the total catchment area of Manjira river is about 30,000 square kilometers. And finally, this river empties into the Godavari river. And therefore, Manjira river is one of the major tributaries of Godavari. And note that Manjira is an intermittent river. So its flow significantly reduces or completely stops during certain parts of the year. Now this Manjira river in the first two thirds of its length generally flows from west to east direction as you already saw. But in the state of Telangana, this river changes its course and it flows towards north as you can see in this map. Now it is also interesting to know that the final stretch of this river forms the border between Maharashtra and Telangana where Maharashtra comes to its west and Telangana to its east. Now this Manjira river merges with river Haridra and together they merge with river Godavari at the border of Maharashtra and Telangana. So this forms a Triveni Sangam which is sacred for Hindus. Here just note that the famous sacred Sri Jnana Saraswati Devasthanam in Telangana is situated at this sacred location. So now let us discuss about some of the important tributaries of Manjira River. Its major left bank tributaries are Gharani, Vaki, Rina, Tiru and Lendi. Its major right bank tributaries are Terna and Tavarja. And it is also important to note that the dams of uh, Nizam Sagar and Singur have been built on this river and its tributaries. So let us see about them now. See this Singur Dam is an irrigation, hydroelectric and drinking water project. It is located in Singuru village of Telangana. This dam is a major source of drinking water for Hyderabad city. And it is also a popular tourist destination. Now next, the Nizam Saga Dam. It is a dam named after the Nizam of Hyderabad and it is a reservoir constructed across the Manjira River. This dam is located in the Kamaridi district of Telangana. It is located to the northwest of Hyderabad. I note that Nizam Sagar is the oldest dam in the state of Telangana. It was constructed in the year 1923. It was constructed by the Mir Osman Ali Khan. I note that he was the seventh Nizam of the erstwhile Hyderabad state. So these are few facts that you need to know about the Manjira River and uh, Nizam Sagar and Singur dams. Now let us move to the next discussion. Our next discussion is going to be based on this news article from the business page. If you see this news article, it mentions about a term called as comics. So first let us know what is this comics. Then finally we will understand the news article. See comics is the primary futures and options market for trading metals such as gold, silver, copper and aluminium. So it is a market for futures and options. We will see what do we mean by futures and options later. I note that formerly COMEX was known as the Commodity Exchange Incorporated and later COMEX merged with New York Mercantile Exchange in the year 1994. And after that it became the division that was responsible for metal trading. What you should remember is that COMEX is the world's largest futures and options trading for metals. And in India, futures trading in metals is carried out in multi-commodity exchange. So now let us understand futures and options. See, futures and options are derivative instruments. They are tools used by investors when trading in stock market. Actually, these two are similar financial contracts between the buyer and the seller of an asset. And they also offer huge potential to earn huge profits. So what do we mean when we say they are derivative instruments? It means that they are financial instruments whose prices are based on an underlying commodity. Let us take an example here. Let us say one gram of gold is 5000 rupees. Now an issuer chooses to issue a financial instrument and rice money based on one gram of gold. Then the price of this 
will be rupees 5000 at that time but when the next day if the price of the gold goes to 4500 per gram then the price of that instrument will also become 4500 so this is what a derivative is the price of that financial instrument is based on the underlying commodity if that commodity is gold then its price will be based on the gold so a future is a contract and it is a derivative like we saw especially a future is an agreement to buy and sell assets at a future date and it is a binding agreement on both the buyer as well as the seller to execute a transaction so that means if they enter into a futures contract they have to carry out that transaction and since it is a derivative the price of future is derived from some underlying asset now what about options see option is a contract that gives the buyer the right but it does not give them the obligation to buy a commodity at a specified price at a specified future date we saw in futures contract that it is binding agreement that if they enter into the agreement they have to execute a transaction but this is not so with respect to options because it only gives the right to the buyer whereas there is no obligation to buy that commodity let us take an example to understand this if a farmer has 50 kilograms of corn and he wants to sell it for 50000 rupees that means he wants to sell 1 kilogram of corn for 1000 rupees so now a trader is interested to buy but he doesn't have the money currently so he enters into an options contract with the farmer now this contract states that the buyer shall have the option to purchase the corn at a specified price at a future date for example let us assume that the future date is after 3 months so that means at that particular future date the buyer shall have to pay the price of the option which is rupees 1000 per kg of corn so here what will happen is if the buyer returns after 3 months then he will buy the corn at rupees 50000 only that is even if the price of the corn has reached 10000 per kg then also that particular buyer will pay 1000 per kg only because he has bought a contract and he wants to exercise his right to buy and that is why in this scenario the buyer will make a profit but this scenario could be the other way around also because what if the corn market crashes and what if the produce is just worth 100 per kg now in this scenario the buyer can exercise his right to not to buy the corn from the farmer and in this scenario the option contract expires so here the farmer will have some kind of benefit because already the buyer has paid 1000 rupees for the option so this 1000 rupees will now belong to the farmer and the buyer will lose this 1000 rupees which he invested in that option so this is the difference between futures and options and note that both of these are traded in comex now initially we saw that comex is the primary futures and options market for trading metals such as gold silver copper etc so the news article mentions that a weaker dollar is helping the precious metals that is it is helping it to increase the value of the precious metals so how does this happen here you should understand that the price of gold is generally inversely related to the value of united states dollar why because gold is dollar denominated but don't assume that only uh, the us dollar has some role to play in the price of gold even certain other conditions are also required to affect the price of gold but if everything falls into place and if the us dollar is stronger then this tends to keep the price of gold lower and it tends to keep the price of gold more controlled and contrastly when there is a weaker us dollar then it will drive the price of gold higher why because there is increasing demand see here us dollar is weaker that means more gold can be purchased with this dollar and that is why when us dollar is weaker the price of gold is higher so this is the relationship that they have explained in the news article so in this discussion we saw about comex we saw what are futures and options and we also saw the relationship between the price of gold and the us dollar now let us move to the next discussion our next discussion is going to be based on this news article from the chennai edition in this discussion we are going to see about an important personality and a social reformer the news mentions that the tamil nadu government has proposed to construct a memorial for ayodhya das pandita 
Why? Because he has made significant contribution to the Tamil Nadu's unique political identity. So in this context, let us know about him and his contributions. And we'll also see some of other important uh, social reformers from the South India. See, Ayodhidas Pandita was a pioneer in Indian Dalit political history. He was born in 1845 and he was born into a family that had the backing of uh, conventional education and they were practitioners of Siddha medicine. Ayodhidas started his uh, journey in the hill station of Uti. Remember that Uti was the summer capital of Madras presidency at that time. So he grew up there and he began his social work by organizing several events for the tribals. This led to the founding of a Dravida Pandian magazine and he also established the Dravida Mahajana Sabha. This Dravida Mahajana Sabha worked towards land rights, education and other civil rights of the people. See here you should remember that Ayodhidas Pandita was one of the early critics of the idea of India that was being proposed at that time of freedom movement. He said that it would merely end up catering to the benefits of uh, Brahmanical political class. See when uh, Swadeshi movement got aggressive during the Bengal partition in 1905, its influence was also felt in Tamil Nadu and at this time Ayodhidas strongly opposed it. He was critical to the approach of nationalism. He also analyzed the pros and cons of the rise in nationalism. Here you should note that reservation, rational thinking and anti-Brahmin movements became the framework for 20th century Tamil Nadu politics. This framework finds roots in the works of uh, Ayodhidas Pandita and even recent research also shows that the work of Ayodhidas Pandita has significantly contributed to the unique political identity of Tamil Nadu that we see today. Apart from this, Ayodhidas has also made a contribution to the cultural sphere of life. See, when Buddhism in India went through a period of renaissance, Ayodhidas existed as a key for its emergence in Madras presidency. Why? Because he brought Buddhism to Madras presidency as a social reformation method. In their 1898, he set up a society for Buddhism. Its uh, headquarters was set up in Chennai and it had branches at various places. Now to manage and coordinate the functioning of this society, he even began a weekly magazine called as Tamaran. This was uh, started in 1907. Actually, at that time, Buddhism attracted many modern-day leaders and intellectuals of the country. But yet, Ayodhita's approach stood apart because he followed an evidence-based method and documentation of Buddhism. He used inscriptions, statues, literary scripts, traditional folklore, festivals and beliefs of Buddhism to gather information regarding it. He believed that the Buddhism has been distorted by the invaders and it has been distorted by the caste structure. So he wanted to learn Buddhism in its original form. And that is why he went for the approach of evidence-based method and documentation of Buddhism. So with respect to Ayodhidas, what you have to remember is that he was a pioneer in Indian Dalit political history and he had made significant contribution to the unique political identity of Tamil Nadu and he played a major role in spreading Buddhism in the Madras presidency. So now, apart from Ayodhidas Pandita, you should also know other social reform movements in South India. For example, first if you take uh, Sri Narayana Dharma Paripalana Yogam. See, it was an organization for the educational betterment of the socially and educationally underprivileged people. It was founded by Dr. Padmanabhan Palpu. He was a social revolutionary and fighter for the Arava community of Kerala. He started uh, this organization with the guidance and blessings of uh, Sri Narayana Guru. You should also know about Sri Narayana Guru because he was also a social reformer. He led the Erava community in Kerala and he made them to change their social practices. He proclaimed the ideals of unity for his people because he also belonged to the Erava community. He also argued against treating people unequally on the basis of caste differences. So according to him, all human mankind belong to the same caste. And there is also one famous quote of uh, Sri Narayana Guru. It is, Urujati uh, Urumatam Urudayevam Manishyano. It means, one caste, one religion, one God for humankind. So you can use this quote in your uh, essay paper and also in your general studies paper. Then another important organization that you should know with respect to the social reforms in South India is the Vokaliga Sangha. 
So this sangha was constituted in Mysore and it launched an anti-Brahmin movement in the year 1905. Now next comes the justice movement. This movement was started in Madras Presidency and it was started by C. N. Mudaliyar, T. M. Nair, and P. Tyagaraja. It was started to secure jobs and representation for the non-Brahmins in the legislature. So this was the justice movement. Now the next movement is the self-respect movement of Tamil Nadu. It was started by E. V. Periyar Swami Nayakar, who is famously known as Periyar. He rejected Brahmanical culture and religion, and he is one of the reasons why caste surnames are not included by the Tamils. Because he also dropped his caste name Nayakar in the year 1929, and he changed his name to Periyar. And this culture spread among the people of the state. So these are some of the important social reformers and uh, social reform movements in South India. Take note of it; it is important from the prelims perspective as well as it will help you in your uh, main answer writing when you are talking about social reforms. Now let us move on to the next discussion. Our next discussion is going to be based on this news article, which is with reference to India's logistics agreements with other countries. So we know that. In the year 2016, India signed a logistics agreement with USA. It is termed as the Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Agreement, in short, LEMOA. And after that, it has signed several logistics agreements with other countries also. For example, India has signed logistics agreement with all the Quad countries, that is, with USA, Japan, and Australia. Then uh, it has also signed these agreements with uh, France, Singapore, and South Korea. And now the news is that. India is going to sign a logistics agreement with Russia, and this will happen in a month or two. This agreement has been named as the Reciprocal Exchange of Logistics Agreement, in short, RELOS. So today, let us see what is this logistics agreement, what are its benefits, and we will also see about RELOS. So let us start with the understanding of logistics agreement. So it is an agreement that is signed between two nations for executing various activities and to assist each other. and these agreements are basically administrative agreements and they are designed to facilitate the access to military facilities and also to simplify the logistical support so what do we mean by that see a logistics agreement would require both countries to provide their bases to provide fuel and other kinds of logistic support to each others fighter jets and naval warships apart from this logistical support with regard to weapons facilities is also provided but this involves only the non offensive military equipments but note that such kinds of support involves cashless transactions on a reciprocal basis and such an agreement is particularly beneficial at the time of disaster relief operations so on a whole you should note that these logistics agreement help to facilitate the replenishment of fuel rations spares etc then it also facilitates maintenance for the other nations warship military aircraft and troops during routine port calls then it also facilitates joint exercises and the trainings carried out in each other's countries and finally it also helps during humanitarian assistance and it helps in disaster relief but what is the actual help it provides see this agreement simplifies the bookkeeping during such events and it ensures that the forces of the visiting countries are benefited by using the host nations existing logistics network so when this happens it reduces the overall costs and it also saves time so now let us discuss about the relos that is the logistics agreement that will be signed between india and russia now this agreement enables seamless access to both countries military bases and support facilities so under this agreement once an indian naval ship enters into the russian port it will be provided with fuel food and water lubricant and port services and a similar help will also be provided to the indian air force planes in addition to all this an indian service personnel who will avail the reciprocal exchange of logistics arrangement that personnel will also get help with local transport here you should know that if russia provides these things then on the same lines the russian ships and aircrafts they will get similar services in the indian ports and air bases and that is why it is called as reciprocal agreement and these spare parts communication and medical services are part of this agreement and these cooperation will be extended during port visits during disaster relief work and also during exercises between the armed forces of these countries now initially we saw about lemoa 
here you should remember that lemova is the first foundational agreement signed by usa with india so generally usa enters into four foundational agreements with its defense partners these four agreements are the general security and military information agreement gsomia then logistics exchange memorandum of agreement that is lemova and then communications compatibility and security agreement that is comcasa and then the basic exchange and cooperation agreement for geospatial cooperation that is deca so these are the four foundational agreements of usa and usa signed lemova with india first and the conditions of this agreement are similar to the one which we saw in the relos agreement so just remember that relos is with respect to russia and then lemova is with respect to usa so in this discussion we saw what our logistics agreement what are its benefits and also about the agreement we are going to sign with russia now let us move on to the next discussion our next discussion is going to be based on this editorial article this editorial basically focuses on the existing system of reservation in our country and it lists out certain major shortcomings of this reservation system and it also suggests certain way forward to overcome these shortcomings so let us see these aspects in this discussion now the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference see so you know that in the recent times the topic of reservation is often in news especially last month also central government approved reservation for the obc and uh, economically weaker section categories within the all india quota for neet you know that neet is the uniform entrance examination for medical and dental colleges across the country so after this move the debate on affirmative action is once again in the spotlight so what is this affirmative action it means the positive steps taken to increase the representation of minorities and women in the areas and fields where they have been excluded historically so these areas or fields include employment education etc and our constitution also provides space for one such affirmative action which is the reservation particularly constitution provides for two types of reservation one is the vertical reservations and the other one is horizontal reservations See, vertical reservations refer to the social reservations that are in favor of scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and OBCs. So that means the reservation provided under Article 16, Clause 4 of Indian Constitution is a vertical reservation because it provides reservation to the backward classes in the matters of public employment. Then, what about horizontal reservation? See, it refers to the special reservations. and these are the reservations which are in favor of persons with disabilities women etc so for example if you take uh, article 15 clause 3 then this particular provision provides for uh, horizontal reservation because it mentions that the state can make any special provision for women and children and such special provision also includes reservation so you can understand that a provision for women made under article 15 clause 3 in respect of employment is a special reservation whereas the one provided under article 16 clause 4 is a social reservation so on a whole the affirmative action of reservation was brought to give representation to the marginalized groups especially in the power sharing and decision making processes but whether this practice has really provided equal chances or representation for all the different groups within the heterogeneous society is actually a big question because there is always a criticism that certain sections of a particular category they are left out of reservation or they do not get the benefits of reservation so in this regard author has listed two major problems that are present in the current system of reservation in our country because these need immediate policy attention and debate so among these two the first and foremost comes the issue of uh, unequal representation among the subgroups of a particular caste that is not all subgroups within the marginalized sections are able to reap the benefits of reservations now to understand this better author has quoted the data released by justice g rohini commission This commission was mandated to examine the subcategorization of other backward classes that is OBCs and one of the important objectives of this commission was to examine the extent of inequitable distribution of benefits of reservation among the castes or communities that are included in the broad category of OBCs and that too with reference to the classes included in the central list we know that we have a central list of uh, OBCs 
So based on its objectives, the commission submitted its report and through this report, the commission had made major findings. The first finding was that 97% of all jobs and educational seats have gone to just 25% of all the sub-castes classified as OBCs. So only 25% of the castes under OBC have got jobs and educational seats. The report also found that around 25% of the jobs and seats have gone to just 10 OBC communities particularly. And it also found that around 37% of the OBC communities, that is 983 OBC communities, have zero representation in jobs and educational institutions. This is a worrisome fact because the reservation which is provided, it is to the OBC communities listed in the central list. But even then, only certain communities have reaped the benefits of reservation, while other communities doesn't even have a representation. So this report brought into light the inequalities that are present in the subcasts. Moreover, this data mentioned in the report is based only on the institutions that come under the purview of central government. So it is said that the numbers could have gone even high if other institutions were taken into consideration. But as usual, there is no legible data at local levels of state and society regarding these communities and their representation. So as mentioned in its objectives, the Commission has highlighted the inequitable distribution of benefits of reservation among the OBC castes and communities. And the author has noted that this uneven distribution of reservation is also disturbing the political projects because now the political parties are finding it difficult to gain support of the people. So this unequal representation was the first problem. Now the next major shortcoming is the insufficiency of data. We already saw that there is no data available at the local levels regarding the subcasts and communities and their representation. So author also notes that there is no accurate data pertaining to the socio-economic condition of uh, different social groups. See, it cannot be denied that these caste-based reservations have contributed to the upward shift among the social classes, but there is still no proper clarity on the actual reach and access of such policy measures. And this lack of clarity exists due to the lack of data and therefore we can hardly predict the impact of new opportunities on these castes. These are the opportunities that are created by new policies of the government. But their impact is unknown due to the unavailability of the data. So these are the two main shortcomings with respect to reservations in our country. So to address these shortcomings or these lacunae, author has suggested certain way forward which will make the system more accountable and sensitive to the intra-group demands. And the first suggestion is with respect to the policy making. Here author has suggested that the government should make policies that are context sensitive. That is, uh, it should be depending on the circumstances and the policies should be evidence based. See, just because people are saying that they are underrepresented doesn't mean that they are really underrepresented in certain jobs but rather such a claim should be supported by evidence so if the policies are framed based on the evidences then the underrepresentation of certain communities will go away and moreover such policies should also be designed in a way that they meet all the specific requirements of each and every group and subgroup within these groups so this was the first suggestion. Now the second suggestion of the author is to create an institution with the purpose to make a deprivation index. In this index, data from socioeconomic based uh, census of different communities can be correlated and based on that data, the communities could be ranked. And then based on this ranking, community specific exclusive policies can be designed. So the main purpose of this institution is to make the deprivation index and further the institution can also undertake audit on the performance of employers and educational institutions in ensuring non-discrimination and equal opportunity to the communities. And therefore for this purpose author has also pushed for a socio-economic caste based census. We know that caste based census is another topic that is in the limelight now because such a census will provide us with required data and based on that we can frame the policies. So this is one of the main reasons why caste based census is necessary. 
So that is all about this editorial article. In this discussion, we had a brief introduction about the reservation system in our country. We saw about the two main shortcomings uh, in this system, and then we also saw certain way forwards. Now let us move to the next discussion. Okay, now let us take up this news article. It mentions that the Ladakh administration has decided to issue residence certificate, and that too, this will be issued only to the permanent residence certificate holders. So note that this move is actually in contrast to the Jammu and Kashmir because in Jammu and Kashmir Union Territory the government has come up with domicile law which makes it easy to acquire a domicile certificate of JNK even for outsiders so in JNK even outsiders can obtain a domicile certificate if they satisfy certain conditions but whereas in Ladakh the government has uh, stuck with the old rules itself So in this context let us see about this Ladakh residence certificate order of 2021 based on which this rule have been framed so to understand that first we should know what is a permanent residence certificate see it is a proof of permanent residence of a citizen in a village or in a town or in a ward this certificate is issued for availing domicile linked quotas in government jobs and also quotas during admission in educational institutions this certificate certifies that a particular person actually belongs to that state so it is a legal document that serves as a proof of residence and therefore it must be submitted whenever a residence of proof is required so now who is eligible for getting residence certificate under this order of 2021 say any person who fulfills these conditions is eligible so what are these conditions first one is such a person should possess a permanent residence certificate issued by the competent authority in the districts of leh and kargil that is they should already possess a permanent residence certificates and secondly the person who belongs to a category of persons who would have been eligible to be issued a permanent residence certificate by the competent authority of districts of leh and kargil they can also get residence certificates and thirdly the children of the persons satisfying up these two categories they are also eligible to get residence certificate of ladakh but note that there is an exception a person who is holding domicile or residence certificate or even any other certificate in the same manner from any state or any other union territory they are not eligible for being resident of union territory of ladakh that is they cannot get residence certificate and it is also important to note that the provisions of this order actually authorize the tehsildar or any other officer notified by the administration as the competent authority to issue such a certificate so these are the takeaway points from this news article now let us move on to the next discussion so with this discussion we have come to the end of news articles discussion session now we are moving to the next one and the last one which is the practice questions discussion now this first question is with reference to logistics agreements of india the question asks india has signed logistics agreements with which of the following countries australia russia japan united states of america during discussion itself we saw that india has signed logistics agreements with all the quad countries and we know that quad includes four countries india australia japan and united states so that means 1 3 and 4 should be in the answer and with respect to 2 that is russia be careful because as of today russia should not be in answer because india is no planning to sign this agreement and in the future if india signs an agreement then option d will be the correct answer to this question but as of now as of today the correct answer to this question is option b 1 3 and 4 only now this next question is with reference to manjira river it is a two statement question first statement it rises in the state of karnataka this statement is incorrect because during discussion we saw that it rises in the state of maharashtra now the second statement it empties into the arabian sea now this statement is also incorrect because it empties into godavari and it is one of the major tributaries of godavari and here the question asks for the correct statements but both the statements are incorrect and that is why the correct answer to this question is option d neither one nor two now this next question is also a two statement question it asks with reference to futures and options consider the following statements futures and options are derivative instruments this statement is correct we saw this during discussion second statement in india derivatives are traded in multi commodity exchange this statement is also correct 
see multi commodity exchange of india is the india's first listed exchange it is a state of the art commodity derivatives exchange which facilitates online trading of commodity derivatives transactions so it also provides a platform for risk management also this exchange was started in 2003 and it operates under the regulatory framework of securities and exchange board of india and you should also remember that multi commodity exchange offers trading in commodity derivative contracts across varied segments including uh, bullion industrial metals energy and agricultural commodities etc so here both the statements are correct but if you look at this question it asks for the incorrect statements and both statements are actually correct so the correct answer to this question is option d neither one nor two now this next question is based on ayodhya das panditar Ayodhya Das Pandit Dar was an ardent supporter of nationalism during our freedom struggle. This statement is incorrect because during discussion itself we saw that he was critical about nationalism that is he was not a supporter of nationalism during the freedom struggle. So first statement is incorrect. Second statement Ayodhya Das Pandit Dar played a huge role in bringing Buddhism to the Madras presidency. This statement is correct as we discussed during the discussion. and here the question asks for the correct statements so the correct answer is option b two only so viewers with this practice question i have also attached another practice question it is a pair based question this question is based on our very first discussion on the important terminologies on one side types of exoplanets is given and on the other side their characteristic features are given so you have to identify the correctly matched pairs try to attend this question because you have listened to the discussion already but if you fail to identify the correct answer don't worry go back to the discussion again and listen to the discussion and you can easily arrive at the correct answer at that time you can post the answer to this question in the comment section as usual and i'll reply to your answer now with this prelims practice question we have two mains practice questions also these two questions are based on gs paper 2 So interested aspirants can write answers to these questions and post them in the comment section for peer review. Keep writing answers to improve your writing skills. So viewers, we have come to the end of today's Hindi news analysis. If you like this video, don't forget to like, comment and share and to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil services preparation. Thank you.